Hello everyone. Today I'm welcoming Stefan Grand from the company SG Grand. You are the founder and still CEO of the company. You have started the company in 2002, if I'm, I recall correctly on the internet, and your company currently has uh, four offices in uh, Greater China, one in Hong Kong, three in Middle China. You are um, running an accounting firm, uh, doing a bit more than accounting, and we are going to go through that together. You are also uh, doing M&A, you have launched um, a software to help your clients uh, manage their accounting. And I'm especially interested to know how you started, because it seems to be a very regulated industry to do accounting in China, to be an accountant in China, and how difficult it is to start in a regulated industry. I'd be very interested as well to know more about um, what you have seen in China, what you have seen among uh, people who came to you, what you have seen about the mistakes to do, uh, what to do and what not to do. Stefan, thanks for being here and welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and I am delighted that you would be interested in hearing about accountants, actually. <laughs> this is probably the most boring thing on earth. Uh, the, the, uh, I mean, accountants have this really bad reputation, but it is, it is, a, it is a very, uh, very interesting uh, thing to do in China. For the audience, it could be very interesting to understand how to organize actually the accounting before uh, they do some mistakes because it's going to impact their valuation and so on. But I'll let you continue on what you are saying. So today is also a, a very interesting day because um, we, we are yeah. talking. I am currently in uh, Taipei and uh, I am opening our fifth office. Wow, in Taipei? In Taipei, exactly. Um, and uh, the next one should be in Singapore, uh, which I am hoping to open by uh, the end of next month. I actually uh, started this business. Uh, it was a one-man show for the first year, uh, over 15 years ago now. And uh, I had no intention of focusing that much on accounting. Rather, I wanted to do uh, m and used to be a lawyer. And I was more interested in the transaction side of things than in uh, actual, you know, accounting, which I believed had little value added. And in fact, I was wrong. <laughs> accounting has <laughs> tremendous value added. And just as you said earlier, too, it seems that uh, you, you've read on your research. Foreign companies that operate in China all come against the same um, snags and uh, very often bad accounting, um, you know, bad transparency uh, are causing some major issues to these companies. So yeah, accounting is useful. It's useful. Uh, and it's useful for the exit as well. Uh, you talk about M&A. So um, let's begin with some numbers. Uh, could you give us a little, some ideas about where you stand uh, in terms of uh, team revenues, locations? We already talked about it. Four, uh, five actually today, uh, six in the coming month. Um, could you give us a sense of uh, where you stand? We have about 40 people um, and somewhere between two and 300 uh, uh, open active customers. Okay. Um, we have been quite stable around this number over the last uh, two, three years, uh, which is interesting in a certain way because uh, the growth in number of customers is very linked to the, uh, the growth in number of, uh, of new arrivals uh, on the market in China. And there, has not, there have not been as many new arrivals as uh, what we were used to in the 90s or in the early 2000s. So you're talking about the accounting, right? The accounting part. You're not, you're not including the M&A part, right? So 200 to 300 clients, okay. Oh my God, I would love to have two, 300 clients in M&A. <laughs> that would be a lot. That would be a lot. Uh, purely accounting, uh, we have yeah about uh, two, three hundred more at the moment, closer to uh, three hundred actually. And uh, um, our margins have been improving over the the last few years because our customers are buying higher value added services from us. Uh, less purely accounting, uh, more. Uh, transformation work, uh, more, um, I, I hate to use the word, but say, you know, fraud investigations, uh, forensic okay. accounting, things like this. So it's, it's really, um, 
the uh, the technical level of our services, the services we sell our customers, has uh, has gone up a bit. Okay, I'm writing down a couple of things you just said because I would like to go back on it uh, later on. Um, so. You, you were saying you are you you are uh, also offering uh, higher value uh, um, added uh, services such as fraud investigation. What 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 is the list of services you you, you are providing? Technically, uh, I, I will give you the uh, the fifteen seconds elevator pitch on the uh, on the services of the firm. Um, we have three layers and another silo. So for the three layers, basically, um, we do. Everything around the setup, apart from up creating companies in, in certain uh, particular areas in which we use our trusted partners, but uh, for very simple work, we do, we do create the companies uh, ourselves. In Hong Kong, for example, a lot of our business is uh, creating and operating companies, like creating companies and doing you know, uh, monthly accounting, uh, tax, uh, tax work for, for our customers. And so we do this work, we do a limited reviews, um, tax declarations, payroll, all the, everything that a normal accounting firm would do in the West. Uh, and we do some uh, audit preparation work. Uh, the second layer is more invasive uh, consulting uh, services. Uh, for example, uh, as we were saying earlier, uh, fraud investigations, um, value-added due diligence work, uh, commercial due diligence, <clears throat> and uh, um, uh, working capital optimization. Working capital optimization, for example, is the, the art of finding money inside of companies. A lot of foreign companies have financing issues, and a lot of these financing issues come from um, a poor management of working capital. The thing is that for a lot of foreign managers coming into China, they have to interface with the Chinese market through uh, Chinese staff, and the Chinese staff very often uh, try to keep things done as they've always been done. That is very mm. much, you know, um, uh, when it comes to, uh, to, to managing the... Um, the suppliers they will uh, they, they will give them uh, they will pay them immediately and management of the clients they will uh, mm. they will give them very good payment terms and so on and so forth so uh, helping companies manage this uh, goes beyond just taking care of the suppliers and the customers uh, you have a lot of cycles to put in place, a lot of procedures and protocols to put in place inside of companies to train the people, to check that things are done properly and so on and so forth. But it does have some actually amazing results because companies have money in them and we just yeah. help them free this money. And more of it's... It's it's a country. I mean, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but where where banks are not financing uh, SME, so we're managing your working capital is key. Absolutely. Um, in spite of what you would hear when you talk to bankers, uh, the bankers actually uh, do not extend credit to, uh, to to SMEs very often, or when they do extend credit. Um, they would, just as, as is the case uh, at the moment for some customers of ours, they would extend uh, working capital loans that have to be repaid in full before they're extended again. Um, mm. If you extend mm. a working capital loan of, say, $2 million, the equivalent of thereof that is around 12, 13 million uh, RMB, and you have to repay it completely before it is extended again, you will have trouble at that point. Yeah, at that much. point, we actually do uh, we do lend money to our customers okay. because we know them well. Uh, we know where they live, 
and uh, um, we help them bridge this. But in most cases, they could they could completely avoid all these problems by having uh, sensible management of working capital. I see. Uh, the, the list you mentioned, um, advising on managing um, working capital, fraud investigation, is it is it a product you can serve? Is it some you do go through a grid of, of checks and so on, or is it really tailor made for every client? It is tailor made for uh, every client, except to say in in terms of um, working capital optimization, for example, um, you have some parts that are you know ready to well uh the the basic trainings you explaining people what to do this is very straightforward uh, giving the trainings to the companies uh, to to the staff of the companies is very uh, is very straightforward it's very easy we have everything in place now implementing it is more complicated for working capital uh, optimization would be to start with a training we give the, the teams of the uh, of our customers explain them what this is all about and how they actually can work all together uh, make all the, the cycles work in the same direction um, very often in a company, you know, for example, salespeople will do anything to get their commissions. Therefore, they will push the sales uh, through as quickly as possible. Uh, manufacturing will have a, a different approach. Um, people in charge of, of uh, the uh, of acquiring the supplies will have a different approach again. So it's a this way you push people to all work in the same direction and together with the top management. And this is actually extremely helpful. Uh, it goes beyond this in the sense that it will also um, help customers uh, get out of organizational pickles. Um, in the case where, a, um, say, there is a um, uh, what I call the Danone situation, where you have you're having a major issue with your um, with your Chinese partner or with some of your Chinese staff, you can regain control and by making people working together. It's actually a side effect. It's a very very positive thing. Um, but this, after the trainings, the uh, the coaching. And the follow-up, it's this is this is really very very tailor-made. Okay, I see. What, what difference do you see in managing working capital in China and the West? Do you see some specificities, or because I feel that what you're talking about could actually be useful for companies the world? Uh, as a specific aspect for China, I know the FAPIO system has been sometimes it mixing what is sales and revenues uh, with the registered income and so other specificities. It is, it is hard to even get started on this because um, on paper, there shouldn't be any specificities. Maybe you know, some, uh, some legal differences here and there, some, some regulatory uh, differences. Um, the reality of things is that people think very differently in China. Um, they think very differently in the sense that, for example, uh, the relationships are more important than contracts. And this has a direct impact on the way business is managed. As we were saying earlier, you know, for example, uh, managing a, um, uh, a customer or managing a supplier with whom you have existing relationships or with whom you build a relationship uh, might cause a... Um, what we foreigners, we Westerners, would consider to be uh, undue softness. So this this could cause a, a lot of issues. In terms of reporting proper, um, the, uh, the there are some impacts of two things. I think that two two important um, social dimensions. The first one is that. Uh, there is no very clear truth in China. And therefore, um, two different ways of looking at things uh, will be just as true 
as uh, one as the other. Um, and the other thing is that, and I'm talking here, for example, for your, your accountants mixing up yeah. uh, uh, cash and accrual or yeah. not understanding really what accrual means. And this is a terrible thing. I've actually seen it. I hate to say that, but uh, not just with uh, local accountants that have been trained locally, but also sometimes uh, Chinese accountants who had their uh, accounting diploma from a uh, European or Australian university. Uh, I'm saying European or Australian because I, I, I saw the, ca the cases in um, I saw both of these cases. Yeah. Um, and another thing, obviously, is that because of the uh, the hierarchical structure, uh, the very strongly hierarchical structure of Chinese society. Uh, the accountant will basically say what the accountant believes that the boss wants to hear. And therefore, a new mm -hmm. truth will be created. And this is, this is very dangerous. This is, um, this is causing a lot of trouble. It works perfectly well in, in Chinese society, and it's not a problem at all. It's just a problem where, where, when you have, you know, the clash between uh, the Western need for reporting and uh, the Chinese society. So, first line of services, accounting. Second line is specific specific uh, services such as working capital optimization, fraud investigation. You talk about the third. I did I miss it or have you mentioned it? Third one would be corporate finance. Uh, it's it's very straightforward. It's uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, capital raises and uh, and capital restructuring. So the parallel silo uh, is software. Uh, a few okay. years back, uh, when trying to uh, oh my god, it's a long time ago already. It's over ten years ago. I realized uh, when I was trying to open uh, an office uh, in southern China that we would have trouble finding somebody who would be sufficiently. Uh, independent to run the office there and uh, one of uh, my associates said I guess not a problem we're just going to recruit an assistant who will go get uh, the, uh, the the information the, the vouchers etc from the customers will Xerox them and fax them to us still we're still talking about faxing and yeah? so it's really 10 years ago um, and the first thing that came to my mind is that what a waste of time. Why don't we just create a, an interface that allows the clients to um, input their figures uh, within the process of production in their company that is basically you know, a, an interface uh, that allows them to enter the vouchers instead of doing it on Excel. Uh, instead of creating Excel spreadsheets that they send by email, which was the case at the time, which is still the case today, actually, uh, and causes a lot of different problems. The, uh, the One problem is the quality of the data, because when you fill an Excel spreadsheet, um, your hand is not held sufficiently tight. You might actually um, format the data uh, in, in ways. Sometimes people, instead of saying, you know, 30,000 uh, will write San Man uh, with the Chinese character. Uh, if you don't have 30,000 written in the, in the spreadsheet, you, you have San Man at some point and then say 2,500 in another cell, the, the data is not clean enough to actually use automatically. Um, and the other thing is that you're sending emails, you're sending new versions of the documents, the names are not necessarily updated. If they are updated, great, but the documents go all over the place. So we created this interface that would feed a, uh, a database uh, and uh, centralize the approval systems. That is, you know, the, uh, the say the uh, the salesperson in uh, Xi'an will, will fill his vouchers uh, that get uh, verified by somebody in Chinese uh, in, uh, in Shenzhen and then get uh, sent to the management uh, that will open them in French, English, Italian, German or Spanish anywhere in the world through the internet as long as they're using this interface. Uh, 
So this is what we created. And uh, from this, we went to, we added a level of reporting, of detection of outliers, and uh, I'm adding a level of machine learning now on top of this. So the name is OBK, right? The name, exactly. I'm, I'm happy that this, this is becoming a very uh, famous uh, solution. We need a research. The name is, is indeed OBK because it started actually as online bookkeeping before it, it started completely growing out of its, uh, of its league. Um, it were, 10 years ago, it, it was an online bookkeeping system. But based on what you said, that uh, it's very difficult to change the practices of people who are used to work in some specific way. Uh, have you, have you, your clients and people, I mean, maybe it's beyond your clients actually, use the software or they're still, they still reluctant to use, to use it? How implemented is it? It is uh, quite well implemented and the, uh, the clients usually love it. When I'm saying the clients, I mean the management because the management gets a level of transparency they cannot get uh, without it. And they get a level of control that they cannot get without it either. The, uh, another thing is that uh, the, um, uh, the payroll is also managed by, uh, by OBK and the new generation of uh, OBK that will be uh, completely web-based uh, due to um, you know, an improvement of, the, of technology and to more security now that you can obtain directly uh, through your browsers. Um, the, uh, the new version will also help uh, bring extra layers of uh, visualization of, uh, of all manners of, um, of, of tools of control for, for the bosses. There are two ways very much to make people use it. And uh, in the old times, if I may say, they, the, the, the last few years, we've been using mainly one, which is coercion. Uh, I hate to say that, but the bosses love it. So you just have to put in their hands something they love and they will force their people uh, to use OBK. Um, the new generation of OBK will be gamified. That is taking advantage of the, uh, the, natural, uh, the natural desire for a good game. So the, um, the users will earn points, badges, uh, will be on leaderboards, will compete against one another for the speed and the quality and the accuracy of the, uh, the, the data they put in OBK. Okay, I try to visualize how OBK is working. Is it an app people use on their phone and then take pictures of FAPIO invoices and so on, and then it's uh, uh, putting things online? Is it on desktop? C could you tell us more about how, how you interact with the software? It, it is both. Um, that is, for example, um, you, you need to have a desktop to have access to uh, full-sized uh, visualizations. To have, to have access to full-size reporting, it's, it's, much, it's much easier, much, much uh, clearer on a, on a desktop. Uh, however, for daily use, uh, using, using the, uh, yeah. the cell phone app, uh, that allows to uh, shoot a picture of a um, of a FAPIA, of a, uh, a tax receipt, uh, upload it onto the cloud, and uh, and recognize uh, the, uh, the 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 sums on it. Um, it. It is the uh, is the way most people actually uh, uh, interface with the machine. It's uh, through their cell phones. I see. So it's recognizing even the number. You don't have to put a number. It's recognizing by itself the numbers. But you may have to allocate in which category you put the numbers. Categories, and obviously there may be some. You know, you have to also check. But yeah. uh, the OCR technology is uh, is working very well. We we, are, we did not invent it. I, although I would love to say so, but uh, we are licensing a technology for this. Yeah, sure, sure, I understand. Um, okay, 
Uh, got it. So you have this infrastructure, software infrastructure, which is mainly impacting your accounting services, right? Because you said you silo in between the three services, which is mainly for the accounting services. Yeah. This is this is for the accounting services. Um, the the thing is, um, for us with this, we are providing um, better quality services. We we really we really taking out uh, a layer. We are we are taking out the middleman here. The you know typically the accountant that will receive a shoebox filled with vouchers mm. and. Uh, and I am actually not joking here. This is, it's a very, very common thing. So we're just taking that out. Uh, the accountant from SJ Cran that is a user of OBK is virtually sitting in your office with you. And you can okay. communicate with him uh, through, the, uh, through the desktop interface as if the person was actually uh, sitting in the office with you. Uh, through a, a chat system. <clears throat> I see, I see. I'm thinking about it. It's also a way for you actually to to get closer to your client and get better um, retention, right? Because using your software uh, makes them very, very dependent on you. It, it goes beyond this. The, uh, the, the problem that most firms uh, are seeing today is client acquisition. Client acquisition is actually extremely expensive. Uh, and you know, if you're if you're an accounting firm and you're trying to sell accounting services to a uh, to a, to a company, uh, you need to find them at the exact moment when their accountant has died, uh, has said that she was pregnant, or um, has just been caught stealing or resigned. You got those cases. If you, we had all of them, uh, especially the the, <laughs> the 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 caught stealing and the and the getting pregnant. Um, the uh, if you catch them three days before, they will have forgotten you when the uh, when the switching events uh, when the switching event happens. If you catch them three days later, they will already have found another accountant. Uh, so for us, having OBK allows us to contact companies and propose them something that is actually a lot better than what they have and does not need them to change their accountant. And we already... I have. see. And I then see. we can actually change, the, the, replace the accountant when, when the time comes. Or replace okay. the other Chinese okay. firm that we've been using, which I is see. also uh, something we've done a lot. It's replacing uh, uh, Chinese firms uh, or uh, very cheap foreign firms. Uh, very often, foreign companies, foreign business people, actually very often entrepreneurs, because they're the ones that are the most likely to want to take risks, uh, will save on accounting. Because, you know, accounting doesn't make money. Mm. Uh, you think that there are, there, there are, you know, you, there are many ways to do accounting and uh, basically you're taking a substandard accountant, but he has those good relations with the tax authorities. So you're very happy with them and all right, fine, he doesn't speak much English or French or whatever, but... Um, doesn't matter because uh, you're some Chinese person from your office will manage that person. Well, this is a recipe for disaster. And basically, you have no idea of what's going on inside of your firm. You have no idea of your actual financials. It's a you're you're permanently um, um, you you you're driving a um, an aircraft in the fog without having uh, you know in instruments uh, without having instruments on and this is really a problem that most foreign companies are seeing today is that they're too reliant on people who don't have a very clear idea mm. of what mm. you expect from them a lot of mm. the cheap chinese accountants are basically um I, I am going to say that in as politically correct a fashion as possible, uh, but let's say they are conduits to 
carry out discussions with the tax authorities? I feel that uh, a lot of um, companies, uh, people, uh, local companies have been, and also people working there, have been able to interact with international companies, not because of their core skills, but because they were able to speak English. And actually, they may sell accounting, but they were not really, I mean, uh, skilled in, the, in this in this um, in this field. I want to go back to the beginning, the beginning of SG Ground. Uh, what what brought you uh, to uh, the start of uh, SG Ground, and how did you start? As I mentioned in the introduction, my feeling when someone is telling me uh, I I'm going to start an accounting firm, I'm I'm I'm, I'm thinking uh, immediately, wow. It should be a lot of paperwork. Should be, uh, should be. It's very regulated. Um, how, how did you start? How, how did you start, and how, how, how did you make it happen? Um, so I, I had run an accounting firm uh, before. I had run a uh, actually a, um, a large network in China for a couple of years, and uh, it was it was a first for me. Uh, um, I used to work in law firms. I was a management consultant before. And um, I did not have a very high opinion uh, of accountants in terms of the value uh, they were adding to companies. So when I started running that accounting firm, I, I realized that there was actually a lot more value delivered uh, and not just uh, because of the advisory work, also because you need Accounting. Accounting is not a matter of, you know, having it a lot. It's a matter of life or death for companies. So after the experience with the other accounting firm, which I decided to leave uh, to start my own outfit, um, I started by what I could do and for what I actually got immediately the licenses and it was tax advice, uh, something I okay. could do. Myself, I, I was a I was a tax lawyer before I had created the uh, a fairly large tax practice for my old firm, and I decided to start doing this basically uh, tax advisory for companies. And we had some really very very nice clients at the time. It took a very long time to get started. The uh, the the thing is that um, I got started in. Uh, the last days of 2002, okay. um, after a clash with my old company, leaving them uh, and slamming the door pretty hard. Uh, since it was a large firm, obviously, you know, entrepreneurs are, uh, especially in France and in, 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 in the French world, entrepreneurs are not considered uh, to be heroes. There are more people who cannot succeed in large firms. Uh, when I when I left this firm and uh, decided against uh, being in touch with any of my former clients, uh, that was not you know I didn't start with with an existing business. The only thing I had was an existing name because people already knew me. I was I had been a lawyer there. I had been uh, operating in China since. Um, 91 so i start you know my name was amongst those of the of the viable uh, uh tax advisors which city was it uh that was in beijing uh okay you've been with beijing okay i, I i've been in, i was in beijing for a very long time because uh some 25 years ago this is the place where you had to be uh there was some business in shanghai of course but all the decisions were made in Beijing, all the yeah. headquarters were made in Beijing because you had to go and talk. If you were running a company there, you had to go and talk to, say you're running a pharmaceutical company, you would need to have your CEO or your legal rep uh, go and talk to the people at the Ministry of Health all the time. Was it before 2001 and that China entered WTO and was more, more centralized or, or it was because of Chinese culture? because of Chinese culture. Um, I, I hate to say that, uh, but I have not seen a tremendous change since uh, the, the accession of China to the WTO. Uh, we were announced a tremendous change, and uh, I remember seeing uh, these uh, hundreds of uh, 
people from the uh, the trade department in the state or uh, the uh, the European Union uh, equivalent uh, coming and living in Beijing for two three years for negotiations with everybody about everything. And uh, the thing is that in the end, I have not seen much of an actual change. So you said you you, you arrived in China twenty five years ago, right? Which year was it? 91. I was actually... Uh, 91? Finishing law school, yes. Okay. And I had, a, okay. I had a part-time job selling medical equipment. Uh, and uh, my, uh, my employer sent me to China for six weeks. And here I am in uh, 2018, <laughs> still there. 91 is when uh, most companies... Uh, left, I mean, both companies left China two years before, right? So you were in China with the most international companies. So you were in China when uh, China, international companies were beginning to come back, right, to China. They were beginning to come back. Um, France had some issues at the time too because uh, there yeah. was a... Um, uh, a political issue with selling um, <clears throat> military equipment to a uh, I don't know how to say it without uh, without causing trouble but let's say they, the the French companies were blacklisted for for a while yeah. it was very difficult but uh, those were very very interesting years uh, in particular because there were a lot of infrastructure contracts being signed. And uh, those were the heydays of uh, the BOT, of build, operate, transfer systems. And working in a very politically connected law firm, we had all the big clients and we were drafting a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, very complex contracts for power plants, water plants, uh, power transmission systems, etc., cetera, et cetera. That was, it was a very, very interesting time. Yeah, you, you saw a lot, I guess, during the time of industrialization of China and uh, the change of China, the, open, the opening of China. Yeah, it would be very, very exciting times. Did, I did my fair share uh, of the time spent in, um, in second tier cities, in the, 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 the winters of Heilongjiang and the, and the summers <laughs> of, uh, of the southern provinces. I've, uh, I've seen a lot of it. I've seen a lot of it. So you became the firm because uh, from your past experience, you saw that there was a lot of more value in accounting than what you sought. Um, and you had this experience before in China uh, within another firm to do, to do accounting. Absolutely. And um, I I, I'm interested in yeah. the consulting firm and I acquired all the licenses needed to operate a, uh, you know, a bookkeeping, a tax advisory, a training mm. activity. Um, as the activity went along, we just kept on acquiring new okay. I see. How, how long does it take? Um, well, it depends of, of the moment you're, uh, you're, you're asking for that. It depends of the, uh, of the needs of the country, of the political situation, all of that. Uh, I would say in general to obtain a license, if you have the, if you're filling the requirements, uh, it will take three to six months, if you're lucky. Okay. About as much time as it takes to... Okay. Uh, to and get those slides... For an invested... To start the business. Yeah. yeah. When you get those, uh, those licenses, uh, um, I mean, what do you need to do to show that you are able to do tax advisory and to do accounting? Do you have to pass some tests? Do you have to... Uh, show that you are able to do it. What, 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 how does it? How do you get them? Uh, no, you, you do not have to uh, to do this. Actually, uh, I am not licensed to do things. My firm is licensed uh, to uh, to provide uh, those services. Uh, you have to prove that you have the uh, requisite number of people with the uh, with the, the, the diploma necessary. Okay. I see. I so see. your guys have to have the diploma and you have to have enough of them. And then you have to fill out uh, metric tons of forms, uh, take them to the, uh, the, the relevant administrations that will give you approvals that you have to take to other administrations and so on. 
Okay, okay, I see. Um, you expanded then from Beijing to Shanghai, and now you have five offices. C could you could you tell us more about how you expanded your business? Um, difficulties or how easy it is, or, dif or how difficult it can be? Because people may not realize that China is that big. It's a continent, and that you may have to yeah yeah you have, you may have to open in different different locations, and also because businesses are different in different locations. Could could you tell us more about it? Absolutely. Uh, the thing is that it is very difficult to uh, serve um, adequately uh, markets that are two, three hours flight you know, from your from your base uh, for counting in particular. Um, if you, when it comes to say um, restructuring services or consulting, you do not need to have an office where things are happening. Uh, you need to send people. But if you have services you're selling over the course of several years uh, in a very recurring basis, you need to have an office there. And um, it is, as you said, you know, China is a very large country. It's just something that does not... Um, that is not recognized uh, easily because you're thinking that you can actually take a bus between Beijing and Shanghai. Yes, you can take a bus <laughs> between Beijing and Shanghai. It's just going to take you a day. Um, so it's not it's not uh, feasible to operate businesses, uh, recurring businesses that remotely. Uh, the second location, Be Beijing was where I was. So this is where the business started. And again, as I was saying earlier, you know, the business started at the same time as the sauce crisis. And the sauce crisis basically killed the economic activity uh, very much in, in the city. For long. For a long time, for maybe eight, nine months, uh, you couldn't it's get crazy. a meeting. You were not invited to meetings. Uh, people were afraid of uh, even letting you into buildings. You when had, was it again? Uh, that was in 2003. 2003, so just when you started? Just when I started. Wow. I, I, I was very, very lucky. I started right at the time when the good Lord decided to test uh, whether I was tough enough. And, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> obviously I was. But it was extremely hard uh, for, uh, it, I think, it carried through 2004. So 2003, 2004 were very, very difficult years. Yeah. Because it was very hard to, uh, to even have a meeting. I remember having a meeting, having a series of meetings with the CFO of Lafarge at the time. And uh, he couldn't get me into the building. So uh, we found a building that was uh, not as well defended and that had a, a, Starbucks, uh, a Starbucks cafe there. So we, we, we would go there and have our meetings at the Starbucks. But on the opposite, do you think that it was an opportunity for you to get those meetings with very high level people when other firms may not be able to send competitors? I, I, I wish it was the case because uh, I, I really stayed when all the other expats were gone. But that was the thing. All the other expats were gone. There was nobody to I meet see. with. Uh, people were all in a business trip and they were on these very lengthy business trips outside of China. Um, and it, it, it was a very, very hard time. We had a lot of trouble uh, finding the first clients. But I had already invested in offices, I already had staff, and I kept on pushing. But it was a very good test of willpower. Yeah, some people forget, but I was asking you these questions about uh, competition and how it could actually um, ease your, your, your ability to catch opportunities because uh, we forget that uh, the Prime Minister of France, uh, Rafa uh, was the only Prime Minister to come to China. And that's why he uh, began to have a good relationship with China. Uh, and even if he doesn't speak any word of Chinese and didn't know much about China at the beginning. So he converted the opportunity. Um, I, I like to, um, we still have five minutes. Um, I like uh, to, to have your, 
your insights on the most common questions you have to answer to people who start a business in China. The most common questions that your clients have been asking you when they enter China for the first time, and um, let's say the let's say the three most uh, frequent questions. Uh, this is this is a very tough. Uh, it's, it's a very tough question to answer because um, actually a lot of people uh, come do business into China thinking. Uh, two different things and thinking them at the same time. One is that uh, China is chaos. China is, you know, 1920s Africa, and therefore you can do basically all you want in China. <clears throat> and at the same time, they think that they can solve every problem the same way they do in the West. That is, you know, you... Uh, uh, by common sense and using a lawyer. Well, um, this causes a lot of a lot of problems for, for foreign companies. First of all, China is not as chaotic as it looks. It's actually a, a very organized country. Uh, the, the way the Chinese people think, being different, the organization, the way of organizing things is also different. And therefore, for a lot of foreign companies, um, it, is, it is a bit, uh, a bit complicated for them to, to organize things. And I would say that this causes, say, after they've come into China, uh, two main questions. The first one is, how much money do I have to invest uh, in my registered capital? Mm -hmm. And the second one is, uh, how do I get money out of the country? Mm -hmm. and this, this is typical. Uh, so two, two, um, two questions, uh, how do I get, uh, how much do I have to invest? And um, how, how do I get money out of the country? So the, the problem with uh, figuring out how much investment you should be putting into uh, your company in China is that most foreign companies think in very Western terms. Uh, they think that if there is not enough investment, it will be easy to turn to a bank or that it will take a few days uh, to wire money into uh, the, into their their account in China, and it is not true in e either of the cases. The first thing is that you will not be able to get financing from a bank. Some companies are able to, but in most cases uh, they are not able to, especially SMEs. You will not be able to, and even if you end up being able to. The, uh, the healthy way to think about it is to not expect the money to be readily available. Bring as much money as you're going to need based on your business plan, your revised business plan. Because if it's your first business in China, take your business plan, uh, push the income six months in the future and double the expenses. And then, then you have your real business plan. This is how it's going to work. You mean the sales volume, you, you postpone the sales volume to six months because it's going to be slower to start. Okay, I see. And the expenses are going to be higher than you think. Uh, not just Why? The, 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 a lot of people think that, you know, they, they will look at the, uh, uh, at the, the levels of salaries in China, mm -hmm. uh, say, three or four years back. Uh, and say, oh, well, it's much less than in France and, you know, uh, France or, or Belgium or the United States have you know, social security systems and this and that. And we probably won't have all that in China. Well, first thing, yes, you will have them. Second thing, um, you, you know, the old, uh, the old saying, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. So if you want to have good people, you're going to need to pay them. And uh, when we're talking about management, uh, if you want to have good people, you are going to need to pay them the same thing as you would pay them in New York. Not New York State, downtown Manhattan. So uh, they, this, is, this is way more expensive than what most people realize. Uh, also, you know, they, um, uh, the real estate, for example, has started... Uh, catching up with the West in, in places like Shanghai, for example, 
the real estate is actually extremely expensive. Running an office in Shanghai is a very, very expensive game. You want to have people who work well, who have some sort of exposure to Western cultures, who speak well foreign languages. They will be very expensive people that you will put in a very expensive office. So all these, so you, everything is becoming really expensive. This this has a, a ripple effect. It's not just you know your office in Shanghai and your people there. It's also that the salaries have been rising all over the country, and therefore everything is becoming more expensive. And the the money people are making, uh, it gets invested in real estate, and uh, therefore everything everything really becomes more expensive in China. And the reason why um, the sales don't come as fast, it's usually double. The first one is that people still make, foreign investors still make the mistake that, that they've always made, which is, you know, if every Chinese person uh, buys one of my products, uh, I will be selling 1.5 billion products. Well, you have a lot of competition out there and not everybody is interested in your products. And also China is a really big country. You have to take the products and the services to the people for you to have a chance to compete. So things are really not as easy uh, as, uh, as they, they seem to be seen from abroad. Uh, another thing is that we foreigners, we Westerners have a tendency to uh, think that the Chinese are just poor Westerners. First thing, smell the coffee, they're not poor anymore. Uh, second thing, they're not Westerners either. And they will not become Westerners because they have more disposable income. So it's, it's difficult. It's a, um, for foreign companies to actually uh, look at the Chinese market in a very uh, realistic and reasonable way. I see, so a lack of understanding. A lack of understanding. Uh, another thing is that we see China through a very small mm. keyhole. And uh, most companies you're talking to, if they have done their homework, uh, will ask you in which district of Shanghai they have to, uh, to establish their, their business. And the thing is that, are you going to sell your, your products and services in Shanghai? Is this, do you think it's the right place to have a factory uh, producing tires? Um, it's, it's difficult. People, uh, people will, uh, for, foreign managers have this, this, this very small keyhole through which they see China. They see it as Shanghai. And China is not Shanghai. Yeah. A lot of the Chinese money hmm. is actually not in one or two cities. It's not only on the, on the coast. You have to go where your customers are. You have to go where your suppliers are. You have to think of all these things. It is, it is a very important thing to have a look at uh, uh, the, uh, the logistics of your business, uh, from whom you're buying your suppliers and to whom you're selling your products. And obviously, in some cases, it will be Shanghai. For example, for establishing a law firm or a service firm, it is a very good place because you have a lot of universities that will provide you uh, with, yeah. your, with your staff. And Perfect. also, a lot of your clients will be around. So it, it might, at times, make a lot of sense. I see. We are coming to the end of the, um, the interview. Uh, thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, how did you like it? I loved it. It's, it's a pleasure talking to you, Mathieu. Thank you very much. Um, it was very interesting, actually, to do this, um, you know, walk down memory lane. <laughs> yeah, we always uh, realize, uh, looking at the path, that we did much more of what we actually think. <laughs> Thanks, Stefan, again. <laughs> thank you. A real pleasure talking oh. to you.